decoupling, then your spin tends to be aligned along the orbital angular momentum direction. So you generate infinite spin or impact even in the central symmetric material like platinum tungsten tantalum. And they have different signs, platinum positive, tantalum tungsten negative, because of the sign of the spin orbit coupling. And it follows the Hunchu, you know, happening, above happening, and below happening. Okay, and in this paper, uh, the Korean theoreticians predicted the orbital torque to experimentally test the existence of the orbital hole effect. Their idea is as follows. There is always orbital hole effect, and they may generate a large orbital hole current, even without the spin orbit coupling, and then orbital current is directly injected into the barrel magnet, but they do not couple to the spin moment because there is no direct exchange, so it must be converted to the spin current within the barrel magnet through the spin orbit coupling of the barrel magnet. Okay? So theoretically, I think orbital hole effect must exist, as I explained before. And this mechanism is not unphysical, it also must exist. But the problem here is that experimentally it's very, very difficult to identify this one in comparison to the spin hole effect because there is always spin hole effect. We have always the non zero spin orbit coupling. So we decided not to check the symmetry because symmetry is the same, but to check the sign. So according to this orbital torque scenario, there are two channels of spin orbit torque. The first channel, Always orbital hole effect comes first, but that orbital current is converted to spin current within the normal metal through the spin orbit correlation of the normal metal, and then this spin current is injected into ferromagnetic sort of torque. So this first channel is corresponding to our conventional understanding about the spin orbit torque. Each magnitude is given by spin or conductivity of normal metal. But the second channel, orbital current is directly injected into the ferromagnet and converted to the spin current through the spin orbit correlation CFM of the ferromagnet and exert the torque. And each magnitude is given by CFM, spin orbit correlation of the ferromagnet multiplied by orbital hole conductivity of normal metal. And what you measure is the net spin orbit torque. This is the summation of these two. So if the second channel, this one is larger in magnitude than the first one, and also, if this one has the opposite sign to that one, you may have an uh, incorrect sign or abnormal sign of your net spin orbit torque. So we performed numerical calculation to find out which ferromagnet normal metal bilayer would be uh, give us the best opportunity to observe this effect. So first we calculated the CFM for various uh, transition metal ferromagnet and we found they are all positive and nickel has the largest value. Because they have the same sign, we must have different sign in uh, between the spin hole conductivity red and orbital hole conductivity black. So we have calculated for two representative heavy metal platinum tantalum and we found that tantalum satisfied that condition. So we believe that uh, nickel tantalum would be the best combination to identify the orbital torque. And our collaborator at KIST have uh, carried out a spin torque ephemeral measurement for various ferromagnet normal metal bilayers. For ferromagnet, it includes cobalt iron, cobalt boron, and boron cobalt nickel, and normal metal platinum tantalum. And I don't think I have to explain this to this audience we can identify what is the sign and magnitude of the damping light tool, and experimental results are summarized in this plot. So this is the DLT efficiency measured from the spin torque ephemeral. So when we use the platinum, uh, even though we change the ferromagnet, it doesn't change much. Uh, so in this case, we cannot say about orbital hole impact. However, when we use tantalum, it shows very systematic changes depending on the type of the ferromagnet and even change the sign in case of the nickel tantalum. And this tendency is in good agreement with our calculation of the spin orbit correlation of the ferromagnet. So this result is consistent 
with orbital torque scenario. Okay, so we observed optimal sign of damping like spin orbital torque in nickel tantalum bilayer. It is consistent with the orbital torque scenario. And this is not only one experiment for the orbital torque, there are many more from Matthias Klaus group. And this is from Otani's group and our own work and Pietro Gambadella's group and so on. So in your previous slide, the work was carried out in 2011. At that time, orbital talk was not very popular. So what, what was the explanation based on? What, what, the, what was the explanation based on orbital Hall effect at that point of time? Because this paper, I, if I see it got published in 2000. 11. The, this one? The previous paper. Previous one? The experimental paper. Uh, which one? This one. Yeah. This is for the spin to get them out. Yeah. Okay, not the uh, next slide. The so next slide? Next slide? Yeah. Was this paper published in 2011? No. 2012, 21. Oh, okay. No, this one. Oh, okay. This paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and there are um, more and more uh, consensus that there may be some orbital contribution, even though I'm skeptical still. <laughs> uh, you can just measure the magnitude is very, you know, ambiguous. Okay, then let me assume there is an orbital torque. Then, uh, natural next question is orbital pumping, because just like the relation between the spin torque and spin pumping, if there is orbital torque, there must be orbital pumping, which is uh, connected via the uh, ohm's half orbit relation. There are already several archive papers, but we found that orbital pumping theory is not complete. So we did uh, our own theory work. In that work, uh, we were interested in uh, what is unique about orbital, because in previous experimental papers, we were struggled uh, to identify orbital because there is no difference in symmetry. We just ma uh, compare the sign and magnitude, but you know in experiment, sign changes... I have a question. So I have a question about the orbital current direction. So if you go to... The intrinsic orbital Hall effect slide. Yeah. So it's on the off side. It's showing. It's like going clockwise, and in the down side, it's going the clock, uh, counterclockwise. So when the orbital current flowing from the suppose in EO star, it's going from tantalum to magnetic layer. The tantalum is in the bottom. So the orbital current direction in that case. And when the tantalum is on the top of the magnetic layer, the orbital current directions and the orbital, uh, orbital current polarization will it be same or different? Uh, okay, so it's the same to the spin hole experiment. If you change the position of your heavy metal below ferromagnet or above ferromagnet, it, they have an awful design, right? Okay, so in some papers, they have more, uh, reported like they have using an intermediate layer to convert the orbital current to spin current. So suppose we are using a heavy metal layer, let's assume platinum. So we are using tantalum, then platinum, then magnetic layer. So it will be all positive because platinum has R and M positive and tantalum showing the orbital current positive. So the current that entering into the magnetic layer is net positive. Yeah. Okay, so in the reverse case, when tantalum on the top, then platinum, then magnetic layer, then the orbital current that coming is also positive. And so the R how is the case for the uh, intermediate layer? Because orbital current is negative. So the RMM value is also switching for the platinum? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Okay, right. so if we go to the two channel model of the your spin orbit of uh, slide, can you go to the two channel model please? Which model? Uh, two channels of spin orbit dot. Two slide. channels. Yes.
there are OA pumping current, also OAP pumping current, where M is the, your, your dynamics of the magnetization. So let me first compare OA and pumping current, this one, and well-known spin pumping current. So both pumping current have one term M cross DMDT, the other term DMDT. The first one is related to the real part, and the other one is related to the imaginary part. So they have exactly the same mathematical structure, and it must be because spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum have the same symmetry. Only one difference here is that uh, in the spin pumping, you have uh, spin mixing conductance that characterizes the transmission and reflection of the spin at the interface. But now we have orbital mixing conductance that characterizes orbital transmission reflection at the interface. However, we have additional contribution that comes from the orbital angular position pumping current. Now it, is, it has the different mathematical structure, higher order in M, this is second order, third order, first order, second order, and so on, because it is related to the Li, Lj anti-commutation mathematically. So it is higher order of L. So to make it more straightforward, we assume this specific type of the dynamics and uh, write down the equation that shows which kind of pumping we have. So OAM pumping, you generate DC pumping, just like the spin pumping. You have a one omega AC pumping, but that may be small because it is related to the imaginary part. In case of OA pumping, you have a one omega, but also two omega signal. So OAM pumping has a DC and one omega component. Again, exactly the same as the spin pumping, you cannot distinguish. However, OAP pumping generate Second harmonic signal, 2 omega, which is absent in the spin pumping. So if you can measure this second harmonic signal from the pumping measurement, you may be able to identify the orbital physics. So previous analytical solutions were obtained with several uh, cruel, uh, crude approximations for some technical, technical reasons. So uh, we checked that with uh, numerical calculation. So tight binding, linear response, but we do not consider spin orbit coupling. And here, this is the numerical result. Uh, the red one is the OA and pumping current, and the blue one is OAP pumping current. And gray one, this is important, this is a transverse charge current. So just like the spin pumping plus inverse spin effect, you measure the voltage, right? And it's the same here. Orbital pumping current plus inverse orbital, orbital hole effect, you can measure the transverse voltage. Uh, this is the time domain calculation. Let me focus on the black one because that is the charge current that can be measured in the experiment. So you see you have some offset. This one gives the DC component, but you have a larger 2 omega component. I think it's, it's uh, challenging to measure the 2 omega component in the experiment because this is not kilohertz dynamics, it's, it's a gigahertz dynamics, but it's your, your business, not mine, so <laughs> <laughs> we will predict that's all. Okay. And to my view, more interesting pumping is this one because actually this interaction is uh, kind of weak, but this is really strong, 1 EV order of magnitude. Which means that if you excite your lattice system, so U is the position of your atom, if you generate lattice dynamics, it may be able to generate orbital pumping. So we follow the same approach. First, with crude approximation, we obtained analytical solutions. Then we also found that uh, not only OAM pumping, but also OAP pumping arise. They are related to U cross the UDT and higher order. And actually, this U cross the, uh, the UDT describes the formal angular momentum. So if your lattice rotate like that, you can define the formal angular momentum. And electron coupling with this phonon generates orbital angular momentum pumping. So we did numerical calculation or AM pumping by rotating lattice here. Or AM pumping, or AP pumping, and more importantly, we also have the transverse 
charge current that can be measured in experiment. Okay, so the second part, we have shown that the orbital pumping is qualitatively distinct from the spin pumping because of OAP current. And I have shown that magnetization dynamics pump OAP current. So let's apply on saddle viscosity. If this process exists, meaning that inverse process, this broker process also exists. So if you inject OAP current, real orbital current into your ferromagnet, then it also exerts a torque. We call it as the OAP torque. And this orbital quantity can be characterized by the even order 2 omega harmonic transverse voltage. And because of the very strong uh, crystal field coupling, lattice dynamics can also generate orbital current. Thank you for your attention, and I will have questions. wondering, uh, for spin pumping, there is a quantity known as transparency, which takes into account uh, the backflow of spin current uh, from the heavy metal layer. So is there an analog for orbital current? Uh, that's a very good question. We have also backflow current. Uh, in order to find out, the, estimate the backflow current, we have to understand relaxation process. Yeah. That is ongoing. Okay. Yeah, but um, it cannot cancel pumping current exactly, so it is there, but we don't know how large it is. Okay, and uh, I was wondering that uh, you said this orbital uh, texture is always present, like for all materials. So like if you take, uh, for instance, materials with weak spin orbit coupling, uh, can you potentially see orbital torques even in such cases? Yeah. Like light metals? Right, so that's why uh, so we used a uh, strong smelly coupling material, platinum tantalum at that time, but later experimental studies used a titanium, chromium, okay. uh, some other 3D element, and if they observe something tall, they argue that that is all. <coughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm skeptical about that. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, very interesting working it out in my mind. <laughs> but the, so is um, the possibility of self torques something that you, it's factored into the model? Because I know that yeah, if you've got a conducting ferromagnetic layer, you're going to get a uh, torque from your, uh, from, from that right. layer, like you've got all these metallic layers, of it. Is it, as it can looked at with a YIG, say, instead. Yeah. So it's a really important question. Actually, that was the question that I have uh, seriously concerned in this paper. Mm -hmm. My conclusion, if self-torque is dominant, I must observe similar ferromagnetic dependence even for the platinum case. It is not. So I'm, I'm biased to believe there are some orbital contribution. Right, but in terms of, in terms of uh uh, being able to distinguish this sort of contribution from self-talk and the orbital contribution, so actually quantifying it. Because the damping like torque efficiency might have some self-talk contribution in there. You're right, so, yeah. and it's uh, difficult. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing, because I'm, I'm also yeah, confused yeah. with this. I yeah. don't know what to do. <laughs> it's difficult, I'm sorry. That's it, that's fine, thank you. This, is, this orbital stuff is very interesting, and you mentioned this key difficulty of it being contaminated with normal SOTs that we're used to. Do you think the existing literature on spin orbit is already contaminated by orbital? If so, isn't that, doesn't that make it even more complicated? Because every whole angle needs to subtract the or orbital contribution. Right? Isn't that a nightmare for uh, theory, experiment? And even without orbital studies, it's already a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so the, there is no, no, uh, no, not no. Only few experiments 
seriously analyze the interface effect, and most of them just ignore that. We don't know what exactly the effect of interface, even ignoring the orbital stuff. So I think the same, same answer, it is there. I don't know how big it is. <laughs> One more question. So you looked at nickel tantalum. Uh, I was wondering if there have been studies on like alloys, nickel iron alloys, uh, for the orbital torques. Like this slide itself, you have nickel tantalum, right? But you don't observe uh, this sort of orbital torque for iron tantalum. Iron tantalum. We don't have iron tantalum, but iron okay. boron tantalum. So I was wondering if you have nickel iron alloys. Is there, uh, have there been studies? Uh, I'm just like curious. I, I don't think that was included in this paper, but okay. uh, I was told that uh, nickel ion tantalum, there is no effect. Okay, so, so potentially I, you could think at a specific uh, proportion of nickel it would start to show itself uh, or something. So this is just speculation. My I speculation see. is uh, orbital physics, most important thing is not the spin. Mm -hmm. but the phone. Okay. And the nickel ion is a famous material which has zero magnetic friction. It may be related to that, but okay. just speculation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, uh, it seems to me that most of your calculation based on the p orbital. Have you considered p orbital? Most of your calculation yeah, based yeah. on p orbital. Yeah. Have you considered d orbital? I assume most transition metal is based on d orbital. Yeah, yeah. So the reason why we choose p orbital is because it is mathematically simpler. But uh, in all the papers, in our theory paper, we add uh, d orbital calculation in the appendix or supplementary materials. It's richer and more complicated, but the same phenomena are there. Because the orbital matrix is 5 by, by 5, 25 or nodes, right? So it becomes a very, you need very long equations, so we tend to try to avoid to put it into the main text, so that's why we use the p orbital system. But, but the phenomena is the same. The the quantitatively is the same. Quantitatively the same, but much more complicated. Thank you. Uh, maybe last one. Um, you have mentioned at the start as, as about the efficiency uh, between the uh, experiment and uh, uh, calculation. Uh, they, uh, they have uh, three or four orders difference. And I think that uh, it's because of the uh, uh, density matrix. Uh, uh, one is uh, 2 times 2, and uh, the other is um, such as 2, two L plus 1. And, uh, but uh, if in the d orbitals that the uh, density matrix uh, the order of uh, the uh, density matrix is maybe about 15 plus, uh, 15 plus 15 or something. That is not uh, the order, uh, the difference of uh, spin case and orbital case is not uh, different as uh, the uh, previous, uh, such as uh, three or four orders. And why is that difference? Uh, I mean, um, is there any relation between the uh, density matrix and the uh, efficiency? Uh, simple answer is I don't know. <laughs> it's complicated. For example, the orbital 5 by 5, 25, but actually in real material that includes not only the SPD, so 2, 3, 5, 9 by 9, 81 component we have. I don't know which component give a better, more efficiency. I don't know yet. 
it's, I'm sorry, it's a very complicated problem. I mean, uh, uh, such as the PT case, uh, we see that uh, there is a uh, four orders uh, difference. And uh, that's different story. That is for the orbital rush by effect. That is not uh, directly related to the uh, orbital angular position because rush by effect is well defined for the orbital angular momentum. But the second part, orbital hole effect, they are related to the orbital angular position and therefore the size of the best matrix. Directly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if you have further questions, you can approach your Professor Lee. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do you time? Let's thank uh, Professor Lee thank again. And, uh, the next lecture will be at 11 a.m., so please do come back in time. Thanks.